Welcome back. Today we do the second part of our lecture on the Bayesian brain. As we discussed last time, the Bayesian brain is a concept which allows us to conceptualize some of the critical items that brains are supposed to do. Uh, brains need to learn but also draw inferences um, about what is going on in the world from prior experience. And the Bayesian statistical formula, of course, captures the notion that prior beliefs can be incorporated into statistics. Regular statistics uh, is more frequentist, meaning that we count the occurrence of uh, events and, um, dis and uh, determine the distribution of these events and then contrast this with other observations that we want to differentiate and assign a significance level in terms of their differences. Bayesian statistics is different because it takes into account what has already been laid down and assigns a valence or a number to the belief already formulated by the brain uh, before inferences are being made about um, what the brain is dealing with in the outside world. So we discussed last time that Bayesian statistics is useful in understanding how sensory motor integration works. For example, in a game of tennis, you watch what your opponent is doing with his racket. You know his prior strokes, so you have a prior belief where his forehand might land, and you can then adjust your strategy accordingly. So rather than computing all the raw data about the incoming stroke, you compute the error term from the expectation that you have where the ball might land. We discussed the uh, problem of bandwidth that the brain is facing. A huge number of data points is coming in from our senses at all times, and Bayesian statistics lends itself for compression of the data and just preserving bandwidth. We also talked about Bayesian statistics in the context of decision-making and the relationship to dopamine neurons, uh, which are involved in decision-making processes and error detection. This is a theme that we will expand on in the future quite a bit more. So, uh, we briefly touched on the um, mathematics or the formula that uh, Bayes has laid down. Uh, I think we need to review this in a little more detail in a stepwise fashion. So in the first slide, you see that the central assumption is that degrees of belief can be represented as probabilities. That our conviction in some hypothesis can be expressed as a real number ranging from 0 to 1, where 0 means something like the hypothesis is completely false, and 1 means the hypothesis is completely true. So the second step is that these assumptions now turn the mathematics of probability theory into an engine of inference. A means of weighing each of a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive hypotheses, H, to determine which best explains the observed data. Probability theory then tells us how to compute the degree of belief in some hypothesis, HI, given the data set D. So in the formula here below, you can see that PHI is the prior probability, in other words, the degree of belief in the hypothesis, and PDHI is the uh, likelihood of the data fitting the prior hypothesis. And PHI over D is then what's called the posterior, the likelihood of the hypothesis being true, given the fact that the data um, that has been captured has been observed. 
the denominator in the next slide is nothing but a measure to normalize the data so that all the numbers are between 0 and 1. Um, it's a normalizing factor, the sum of all the probabilities of each of the possible hypotheses. This ensures that Bayes' rule will reflect the proportion of all the probability that is assigned to any single hypothesis, HI, and, relatedly, that the posterior probabilities of all hypotheses sum to 1. And this has been called, very cleverly, the law of conservation of belief. As you may know, in physics, our laws of the conservation of energy or the laws of um, conservation of momentum. So here is the law of conservation of belief. Don't take this too seriously, but I think it's a cute way of expressing that we cannot have all beliefs at the same time. Um, you cannot hold beliefs that differ significantly from each other. So this captures what might be called the conservation of belief. A rational learner has a fixed mass, so to speak, of belief to allocate over different hypotheses. And the act of observing data just pushes this mass around to different regions of the hypothesis space. If the data lead us to strongly believe one hypothesis, we must decrease our belief in the other hypotheses. By contrast, if the data strongly disfavor all but one hypothesis, then, to paraphrase Sherlock Holmes, whatever remains, however implausible a prior, is very likely to be the truth. So that's our review of the Bayesian uh, formula and formalism. And we will now take this information and review a very intriguing paper that uses the Bayesian approach to explain a very strange finding. And it is related to the syndrome of depression. There is a relationship of depression to various other conditions, such as obesity, for example, inflammation, and other medical conditions, usually related in some way to stress or the stress response as encoded by the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So it's not clear why this should be, but the observation has been made that there's often a bi-directional relationship of medical illness and depression. In other words, depression predisposing to medical illness and certain medical illnesses, such as diabetes, for example, predisposing to depression. So in this paper, a hypothesis is proposed using Bayesian thinking, suggesting that there may be a solution and an explanation as to why this might be happening. This hypothesis is called the in interoceptive predictions in the brain. We believe, of course, that all perception follows sensation, and therefore bodily feelings originate in the body. However, it is possible that prior experiences of interoceptive uh, feelings are already coded um, in the Bayesian sense in an embodied way in certain brain areas, and then what is measured or what is responded to is an error term of uh, signals coming from the body compared to the prior hypothesis laid down from previous experience, just like Bayes would suggest. In the next slide, according to this active inference account, the brain forms neural representations that are constructed from previous experience. These functions as generative models of how stimuli in the environment cause sensation, rather than neurons simply lying dormant until information arrives via the external senses, the body, 
that is eyes, ears, tastes, and, and other uh, sensory uh, receptors, um, the brain participates, anticipates incoming sensory inputs, which it implements as predictions that cascade throughout the cortex. As predictions propagate across cortical regions, following their roughly centrifugal connections, they modulate the firing of neurons within cortical columns in, an, in anticipation of these regions receiving actual sensory sensation. That is, what is computed is the prediction error. In the next slide, in this active inference framework, perception and action are tightly coupled, with both arising from the brain's hypotheses about the world and constrained by sensory inputs from the world. By this account, action drives perception to reduce prediction error. This is a um, profound statement, and we will come back to this in future lectures. The next slide shows a typical cortical circuit. You see the pyramidal cells, and what is compared here are the agranular cortices with the granular cortices. Agranular cortices are found in limbic areas, such as the anterior cingulate and the insula, for example. And the hypothesis then states that neurons that you see here in green compute prediction errors. And there are neurons in blue, which are the precision cells that um, encode the original information laid down. And in the next slide, you see the hypothesized anatomical connection of how this might work. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you see a medial aspect of the frontal cortex, in particular area, Brodmann area 25, to which we will come back frequently. And these agranular or disgranular cortices have projections bidirectionally to the insula. Now the insula is a bilateral area of the brain inside the temporal cortex, which is specialized in processing and detecting uh, impulses and sensations coming from your gut. Your gut, um, your skin, your bones. Um, so the inside of your body, the internal world, so to speak, is represented in the insula. Uh, as an aside, there is an entire theory of how the insula may actually contribute to the production of the experience of consciousness in the human mind. Uh, we will get back to that at a later point. So the visceral motor cortices simultaneously issue predictions of the interoceptive signal that are expected to arise as consequences of allostatic visceral changes, meaning there is stress and pressure being put on the body and on the uh, organism, and it changes the so-called allostatic load, and the body now needs to respond and adjust to these demands. And it's felt that the granular cortex and primary interceptor sensor regions of the mid and posterior insula are well suited in terms of their architecture for computing and transmitting these prediction errors and propagating prediction error signals back to the visceral motor regions to modify predictions. Just as we have discussed many times before, for example, in the integration of um, sensory motor uh, neurons uh, in, play, in playing tennis. So this is playing tennis uh, with the um, feelings coming from your gut. So in summary then, this means that interoceptive, in this next slide, perception is largely a construction of beliefs that are kept in check by the actual state of the body rather than the other way around. What you experience is in large part a reflection of what your brain predicts is going on inside your body 
based on past experience. And in the slide here are three references. All of these, of course, will be available in the uh, ebook. Uh, we will put links in the ebook to these lectures so you can refer to my reading of these papers and compare them with the original publications. In the next slide, the bridge now is being built as to what this might mean for the fact that these medical conditions and depression seem to have a bi-directional relationship. So chronic imbalance, which is caused by constantly predicting the need for more metabolic energy to, demand the dem to meet the demands of stressors, can produce the well-known depression-related disruption and eventual downregulation of the HPA axis feedback loops resulting in chronic increase of cortisol. Cortisol being a major stress hormone which is neurotoxic to the brain. This in turn can promote pro-inflammatory states associated with increased level of cytokines and an activated immune pathway. So here's your link. The prediction errors are constantly bombarding the frontal cortex, the um, limbic aspects of the frontal cortex, the system gets overwhelmed, uh, the allostatic load is too high, and what you get is a catastrophic breakdown, reflected then in abnormal function of the HPA axis, leading to increased cortisol, inflammation, and all the negative things that result from that. So, to reduce prediction error, limbic visceromotor cortices begin guiding the body towards a constellation of sickness behavior associated with, for example, fatigue and negative affect that are designed to reduce activity and energy expenditure. Collectively, these behaviors would be the initial behavioral symptoms of depression. So think about it. What you have here is a theory that maps the incidence of depression not only to other physical conditions, but also to the interaction of two particular brain regions. And it's being done by evoking the Bayesian connection between these two systems and invoking the error term and the system being overwhelmed by errors. So this is um, neurobiology and psychiatry linkage at its best. Um, there are a number of findings which support this. And in the next slide, uh, this is just a teaser actually. Um, this is the uh, stereotactic location of um, where deep electrodes are being planted in brain stimulation in very severe, totally treatment-resistant depression. And you can see that the electrodes are placed in an area called Brodmann 25, which is in the anterior cingulate cortex. And that is exactly the region, of course, that the theory has invoked as being one of the driving forces in creating um, this out-of-balance system of error correction and thus leading to depression. We will come back to deep brain stimulation at a later lecture. So the authors then summarize this by stating that perhaps the most speculative but innovative hypothesis concerning the relationship between interoceptive prediction and certain physical illnesses that often co-occur with depression, such as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, that aberrant interoceptive predictions and the compounding allostatic consequences that may result could help to explain the link between these disorders. For example, many of the same regions within the interoceptive system that show morphological changes in psychiatric illness. And chronic pain also has been implicated. Uh, these stresses uh, accumulate throughout the lifespan and leave individuals more vulnerable to 
to these metabolic illnesses with increased risk of mortality, particularly if the stress occurs already in childhood, predisposing the individual later on to these illnesses. Um, another interesting proposal is that a form of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very effective in uh, treating major depression and has been verified in many clinical trials. You can conceptualize cognitive behavioral therapy in this next slide. In a Bayesian sense, the effect of CBT may reflect changes in the way that precision weighting pyramidal cells in the visceral sensory cortex adjust the weight of prediction error signals that are communicated to a granular cortices, thus altering the sampling of inputs that become the empirical priors in subsequent predictions. Interestingly, emerging evidence indicates that the activity within a granular visceral motor cortices predicts whether CPT or pharma pharmacotherapy will be more effective as a treatment option. So here now you have a, complete, a completely closed circle going from a hypothesis in, involving Bayesian thinking to mapping um, the co-occurrence of symptoms of depression and medical problems onto brain regions, making a prediction about why CBT might be effective, and then linking it back to observed changes in these brain regions, which predict who will respond to CBT and who may respond better to antidepressant drugs. So this is a very satisfying way of thinking about neurobiology and psychiatry. Rather than conceptualizing depression as a collection of so many symptoms that need to be present to make a diagnosis, as it's been the case in the DSM, um, the various versions from DSM 3, 4, and now DSM 5. Um, these criteria are very consistent. If you make the diagnosis in South Africa or in America, you will have psychiatrists readily agree. However, the criteria lack validity. So what you detect is not always depression, but other things thrown in. And this is borne out by the fact that there are no good genetic studies linking genetic markers to depression because of the lack of validity in the diagnostic criteria that are used to diagnose depression in the first place. So in the future, psychiatry should be built on a foundation which links clinical symptomatology, the activity of brain regions, the um, proposal of predictions as to what therapy might be effective, and then the proof in the pudding to show that this therapy, in fact, is changing the circuitry that has been evoked by the theory. So that, that's where we need to go away from um, collection of symptoms, we need to go to a dynamic which incorporates not just mental illnesses but physical illnesses into one conceptual framework and relates these to specifically delineated brain circuitry. And in this case, um, Bayesian statistic has been invoked in being fundamental to these changes. So this is then the second lecture on the Bayesian brain. There's more to come. And in the next lecture, I will go into some details that will explain how infants younger than two years of age already have been demonstrated to show Bayesian thinking and the accumulation of priors, which will guide them um, later on in their life and allow them to make inferences. Thank you for your attention, and again, if you have any questions or suggestions, please email us at www.behavioralhealth2000.com. See you soon. Thank you.